Frontier Developments recently announced that they would begin selling early access to new ships and instant outfitting packages that players can buy to jump directly into high-level activities. This presents an opportunity to look at their plans and make some suggestions about other ways that Elite Dangerous can generate revenue that would avoid direct impact to the play space. Building an effective funding model for live service games is tricky. Because of the increased carrying costs required to sustain perpetual development, these games have to generate constant income over time or risk being abandoned. There are several ways to do this. Unit sales rely on a constantly growing audience, or on regular DLC, to continuously attract new and returning players. Unit sales are often paired with other funding methods, and are the most respected by consumers, but generally require fewer large releases at a higher price point. Cosmetic stores are an easy win, since they don't affect the player space directly, and allow for more individual expression. This model works best when individual items are cheap, and is a great way to generate continuous income without hard commitments. Subscriptions are a more robust and consistent method, but come with increased expectations to deliver content more regularly. Subscriptions blend nicely with other methods, but come with a tendency for pay-to-win advantages like accelerated progression. Quality of life funding models, like are seen in Path of Exile, withhold various functions like storage and organizational tools, asking players to pay for better interface designs and more inventory capacity. These models don't affect progression, but can incentivize deliberately bad design to frustrate players into paying more. Pay-to-win models give players a material gameplay advantage that makes them perform better than a non-paying account. I have a strong dislike for pay-to-win systems, as do many others, because these systems create a perverse incentive. A common example of perverse incentives is the Cobra Effect, which happened during the British occupation of India. In an effort to help control the population of poisonous cobras, the government offered a bounty for every dead cobra. There was an initial drop in the poisonous snake population, but as snakes got harder to find, people started breeding them in order to get more snakes that could be turned in for bounty money. Eventually, the government found out, and the bounty was cancelled, resulting in the breeders releasing all their snakes back into the environment. In the end, there were more poisonous snakes after the bounty program than existed before. One of the first common criticisms levied against Frontier came from the announcement that pre-built ships could be purchased from the ARC store. Frontier recently released the specs for their first two pre-builds, a Type 6 laser mining jumpstart and the Alliance Chieftain AX combat jumpstart. Neither one of these builds are up to the meta standard for their respective use, but will work for their stated task if handled carefully. Pre-build ships and their included modules come with a lifetime insurance policy that guarantees a zero rebuy cost if they're destroyed. Players further modify these ships as desired, but their included modules cannot be attached to other hulls, only stored, or sold for a zero credit value. This prevents players from buying pre-builds to strip them for engineered or broker-restricted modules. Handled responsibly, the idea of a pre-built ship isn't automatically bad, but developers across the games industry have a poor track record when it comes to the long-term use of these systems. There is an ever-present temptation to introduce more powerful offerings, or make the free path more difficult in order to incentivize players to pay for the boost. Another interesting change is the implementation of an early access period for new ships. Currently stated to be a three-month premium exclusive, the Python Mark II can be purchased for real money beginning on May 7th. All players who own Odyssey will get access for free beginning in August, a decision that takes some inspiration from titles like Star Citizen 
Microsoft Flight Simulator, and DCS World. Between the two announcements, I take less issue with early access, since it is directly attached to new content that took a lot of effort to produce. This is effectively a way to turn each new ship into a revenue-generating opportunity, and does create a positive incentive to build new ships on the regular, which is something that Elite Dangerous has needed for years. The perverse incentive risk here is that of power creep. The new thing needs to be more powerful, or unique enough, that players feel a fear of missing out by not paying for the early access. This will drive the game designers to push premium releases with more aggressive balancing, which can then be toned down later on. This perverse incentive risk is balanced by the early access period limiting fast adoption of the new ship and exposing any overbalancing issues before general adoption. Players who buy early access ships should regard this purchase as a kind of beta, and should expect these ships to be further adjusted during the early access period. In my mind, this is no different than pledging for a ship in Star Citizen, and should be regarded more as supporting the developer for hard work than anything else. I find that a combination of unit sales, cosmetic stores, and subscription offerings provide the best results overall. Elite Dangerous already has good cosmetics, and I would hope that higher quality and more elaborate ones are on the horizon. Unit sales are likely to be a challenge, given the hard launch that Odyssey has needed to endure, but I anticipate the community responding well to another expansion when the time does eventually come. I do think that subscriptions can provide a chance for strong recurring income. One solution here would be to remove the weekly arcs cap for players who pay a base monthly fee. Increased tiers could automatically get access to all new ships, a Steam or license key to new expansions, or a discount on extra arcs packs should they choose to buy. These suggestions all help avoid perverse incentives, and I believe would make for a better overall relationship between Frontier and the community. When combined with more transparency in the development process, and more information on what it actually costs to make new ships and build feature sets, I think the community would have more context for the amount of effort that is being put into the game, and will be more willing to support it directly. There are some strong negative signals that I'm watching for that tend to happen when developers are pushing towards pay-to-win. If the upcoming engineering rework results in a net increase to the relative grind, if any future ship packages are fully engineered, if these ships offer exclusive performance-altering modules, then Elite Dangerous will have taken a bad turn. There are plenty of space games on the market, which means no shortage of alternatives should things at Frontier go really wrong. I think it's a bad idea to ascribe negative intentions to everything that Frontier does, but I don't give them a pass when they make mistakes. Engineering, premium ammo, and the tech broker system are packed with grindy, boring trite that makes me actively resent the mechanic whenever I have to gather materials, especially for the Odyssey suits. After all this time, I have yet to fully engineer a single suit, and have no plans to do so until that system gives more respect to my time. The Fertilance is still very overpowered compared to the next best thing. Ship flight speeds are far too fast for anything but jousting in open space. Turrets are utter crap in all but a few specific situations. Ship launch fighters still break multiplayer instances. Disposable limpet drones are a pain in the ass, and repair limpets in particular bore me to tears. The automatic field maintenance unit isn't automatic at all, and in case you are interested, every single one of these issues has been talked about in greater detail in my past videos. See my Ideal Elite playlist if you are interested. It's linked on the end cards. After all of that, I still come back to play this game because there are things it does correctly. The sound design is still one of the best implemented features in the game, and even ten years later still beats out Star Citizen for now. 
The flight model feels great with or without flight assist. I can now connect my HOTAS directly to the game without needing five virtual controllers. In Ship VR remains one of the most significant highlights for Elite Dangerous and should absolutely get expanded into the Odyssey ground game. The lore and storytelling predate Warhammer 40k and helped lay the foundation for PC gaming. Elite Dangerous does get things right, even if it gets a bunch wrong. I would love to see this game get some significant overhauls, but that won't happen if the finances don't make sense. As much as people like to complain about Elite being a dead game, there is a surprising amount of life left, and plenty of opportunity for improvement. Several key leadership positions have turned over in the last two years, giving a chance for new talent to try and make some headway. We should definitely and respectfully let them know when we don't like something, and more importantly, vote with our wallets when they don't listen. What is happening to Elite is not a crisis, but time will tell if these decisions bear good fruit. That's all I have for today. Catch you all later.